Good afternoon everyone. Today, our group will present you on a topic of 2.3, which is the Information and Telecommunication Technology. Before I proceed, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mary Anak Harris and you can call me Teacher Mary. And I will be the first presenter of this session. Alright, let us move to the next slide, which is the definitions. Do you know what is the real meaning of IT, CT, and ICT? I think that you're only familiar with the definitions of ICT, right? So, today I will explain more on IT, CT, and ICT based on its terms. Actually, these three terms have different meanings. Let us move to the IT first, which is the information technology. The information technology or IT is the term used to describe the items of equipment which is hardware and computer programs which is software that allow us to assess, retrieve, store, organize, manipulate and present information by electronic means. Meanwhile, CT or communication technology is the term used to describe telecommunications equipment through which information can be sought and assess. So the overall meaning of ICT which is the information and telecommunication technology refers to the technologies both hardware and software that enable humans to communicate with one another. Alright the next slide shows the father of ICT and I will briefly tell you on how he became a father of ICT. His name is Claude Elwood Shannon, who was born on 30th April in 1916 and was dead on 24th of February in 2001. He was an American mathematician, electrical engineer, and cryptographer known as the father of information theory. He is noted for having founded information theory with a landmark paper which is a mathematical theory of communication which he published in 1948. He is also well known for founding digital circuit design theory in 1937 when he was a 21-year-old master's degree student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He wrote his thesis demonstrating that electrical applications of Boolean algebra could construct any logical numerical relationship. Shannon is then contribu contributed to the field of cryptanalysis for national defense during World War II, including his fundamental work on code breaking and secure telecommunications. Moving to the next slides, there are three characteristics of ICT that you should know, which are effectiveness, efficiency, and innovation. So for effectiveness, it should be or it must be most interactive, fewer errors, customized, personalized, achievable, searchable, and acceptable. This characteristic is very important for ICT. And the next one is efficiency. Efficiency has to be faster, cheaper, fewer steps, lower cost, and fewer people, and less paperwork. Of course, you want it to be faster and cheaper, right? And at the same time, you want it to be in a lower cost so that less paperwork can be done. And lastly is the innovation. Innovation is something of a new product and a new technology that is invented by humans. Alright, let us move to the next slide. We show you that there are six types of ICT communication. The first one is the growth of cell phone technology followed by the rise of the internet, cell phones, high definition television, electronic communication, and physical digital media. We are living in the information age and there has never been as app as, uh, as app a name for a particular period of human history. Digital technologies have revolutionized communication in the modern world and 
a revolution so rapidly integrated into our lives that we are scarcely remember how we used to make a phone call or exchange messages back in the analog days. The internet and cell phones are two of the most prominent examples of the influence of the information age, but there are many other types of digital communication technologies. As digital networking has gone from relatively slow and expensive, and computers and phones have gotten more reliable and easier to use, they have gone from being the domain of hobbies and early tech adopters to everyday appliances. So the first point is the growth of cell phone technology. In recent years, billions of people around the world have begun using cell phones. In some cases, the digital devices are even cheaper and more reliable than their wired counterpart, and newer devices come equipped with the ability to speedily access the internet and download a wide variety of apps. While the original cell phones were expensive to use and bulky to carry, and often given to losing signal. For example, nowadays, some of us might have um, sl uh, a slower coverage and slow and slow connection due to uh, certain places. Um, and now, modern day cell phones are reliable and easier to transport. The society has also adapted to the point where it is difficult for many people to maintain their business, career, and social life without carrying a cell phone for some kind. And at the same time, cell phone plans have gotten simpler, especially when it comes to delivering basic communication services such as calling, texting, and voicemail. Many users no longer have to worry about exceeding the minutes allowances um, or waiting for nights and weekends to make calls. The next point is the rise of the internet. For example, it's modern. Right, so the internet has gone from a limited government and academic experiment in of the 1960s to a near universal part of modern life. A modem, as I mentioned just now, is one of the examples, which stands for modulator demolator, is used to transform digital signals from a computer into other form that can be transmitted across a phone, cable, or other network. For example, um, for example, is the dial-up modems of the 1990s and the more modern, modern wireless uh, routers and cables internet modems now are found in many homes and businesses. Modern cell phones and many computers can connect with either built-in Wi-Fi modems or cellular modems that let them connect to phone carrier networks. Wi-Fi routers let them connect to a locally installed, usually hardwired modem and on to a larger network. And nowadays, many offices, universities, and other env environment have internal networks known as intranets that is used for secure internal communication. All right, let us move to the third point, which is the cell phones. As you can see here, the 2G phones was invented during the 19, earlier 1990s and 3G cell phones was built uh, during the 2001 and the latest one is the 4G uh, phones which was released during 2009 and nowadays people are going to launch the 5G phones but they have no actual deaths yet. So I'm going to briefly introduce you to the cell phone first. Um, the cell phone is the earliest generation of handheld mobile telephones relied on the analog communication technology of the conventional phone network. As I mentioned just now, the first cell phones that use digital communication is known as the 2G phones that appeared in the early 1990s. The digital cell phone technology developed 
rapidly after that, the first text message was sent in 1993 and the transmission of the other digital content such as ringtone and advertising followed shortly after. In 2001, the 3G digital phone communication arrived, providing faster transmission and making broadband communication vertical for multiple media such as voice, internet, and GPS. The 4G phones appeared later that they kept offering digital communication 10 times faster than earlier technologies. As for the high-definition television, which is the fourth point, since 2009, the Federal Communication Commission has required TV stations in the U.S. to broadcast exclusively in digital format. The transition uh, from conventional to digital television technologies made high-definition television possible and established the television as more than a simple receiver of transmitted signals. Many digital TVs are multimedia devices that display television programming, games, photograph, and on-demand movies, stream internet content, play music, and handle recorded media like CDs and DVDs. As televisions become more interactive, they, in, they are evolving into two ways of digital communication devices. As you can see that the fifth point is the electronic communication, for example, remote controls, walkie-talkie, Bluetooth episodes, GPS satellites, and credit cards. These are the example of the electronic communications. Digital communication have become famous in modern society and encompass a wide variety of technologies. These examples of technology are had communicate digitally with people and with other devices. Futurists have coined the term of Internet of Things or IoT to refer to the trend of enabling thousands of types of devices from light bulb to washing machines with digital communication capabilities. And recently, in this decade or in this 21st century, we are using the Internet of Thing 4.0. Uh, I mean, pardon me. We are using the IR 4.0. And last but not least is the physical digital media. The physical digital media has given the sophistication of the insta instantaneous transmission of digital data. And it can be easy to overlook the more mundane communication activities. We also store digital data on many types of physical media such as CDs, DVDs, flash drive, tape, and compact memory chips. Every time you hand a friend or colleague a file, whether you transfer it electronically or pass along a DVD, you are engaged in a form of digital communication. Moving to the next slide, there are four periods during the evolution of ICT, which are the pre-mechanical, mechanical, electromechanical, and electronic period. I will briefly tell you on the history of ICT. Alright, during the pre-mechanical period, um, humans started to communicate with one another by using words and pictograms curved in rocks. For example, is the Sumerian pictogram dating back in 3100 BCE shows that it is the earliest form of communications among humans. It is also happened around 1450 BCE to 1450 CE. Pear, which, which is one of the example, is made up from papyrus plant and was invented. Um, it is used to store information during that time. Paper were compiled and bound together and eventually giving birth to books. Libraries we created now is considered as the first data centers in history. It compiled and stored all the books and humans started using numerical system during the late stage of this period. The most popular device created was the abacus that came from China. The abacus um, 
is a device to process information. Alright, so let us move to the next slide which show you on the mechanical period. Mechanical period serve as the bridge between our current period and the pre-mechanical period. It also happens happen during the year of 1450 until 1840. The interest in automating and speeding up numerical calculations grew during this period. The machines driven by mechanical means such as steam and gears dominated information processing and calculation. The mechanical calculator, which is known as Pascaline, was the highlight of this period. It was invented by the famous mathematician inventor, which is Blaise Pascal, along with Wilhelm Schickert. Charles Babbage analytical engine, which is considered as the first programmable mechanical computer, was also invented during this period, and Charles Babbage is known as the father of computers. Moving to the next slide, the electromechanical period had started around the year of 1840 until 1940. The use of electricity for information handling and transfer had bloomed. This period also saw the use of telegraph to transmit uh, information over long distances. The telephone was later invented, which enabled voice transmission over long distances. Human also started to control electricity using vacuum tubes in devices that eventually led to the development of today's electronic gadgets. The telegraph is considered as the first electrical communication device and it is first invented by Sir Charles Wheatstone. The first working model used five magnetic needles that could be pointed around set of letters and numbers by using electric current. Samuel Morse was an American inventor who introduced the first single circuit telegraph in 1844, which gave rise to the Morse code. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell was granted patent for the telephone. Alright, let us move to the last period of the evolution of ICT. The electronic period had started in the 1940s up to present. The highlight of this period is it focused on the advent of solid state device or electronic devices. As you can see in the slide, there are four periods during the electronic period. The first one is the lead vacuum tubes period. The second one is the transistors period. The third one is the integrated circuits period and the fourth one is the computer processors period. Assalamualaikum and very good evening to all of you. My name is Ahmad Syamil bin Muhammad Basri and I'm going to talk about this subtopic about computer and gadget. I know we are familiar to what is computer and gadget, right? But this time, let's see uh, on detail on how they work and what is their function. Let's go. So, this is what we are going to learn in this subtopic. This is first, we are gonna we're gonna learn how the introduction about computer and gadget. And what is system unit and their input and output. Another this storage. Next is system software and what uh, lastly is the application of software. Let's see one by one. Okay now about the introduction to computer and gadget. First is computer. Computer is an electronic device. The operation under control under the control of its own, and is sometimes like a computerized machine. Electron is an electronic machine that used to storing, organizing, and picturing and calculation, and also for controlling other machine. This is the computerized who can control other machine that attached to it, and 
Next gadget is an a small mechanical or an electronic device that with a practical use, and uh, they are often often thought of as a novelty. This is something quality of the new. This is about a gadget. This is about the quality of being new, and from from that they are being striking or original or unusual about something that is a very new they become the gadget sometimes it's more and sometimes it's very benefit to its own or from the original component now we move to the type of computer as you can see there there are uh, four type of computer this first one is a personal computer the second one is a mid-range computer the third one mainframe computer and the fourth one is supercomputer the size is getting bigger and bigger from one to another and let's see what are they Alright, the first one is a personal computer and gadget. It is very small design, is for individual individual use, and they can perform the uh, input processing, output, and the storage all by themselves. They are they are not so powerful computer, but it is wide, widely used from from all over the people in the world. So. There are a few types of them. And there, such as example, we can see that the desktop that really uh, that it been used from um the office, um the at home, and and so on. And the other is laptop. This is used for personal that can carry anywhere and is a portable. Same goes to the tablet. And smartphone nowadays, it is very familiar, and it's a new computer that's been being used from all over people in the world. And also, they can cat categorize wearable in the uh, such as personal computer. It is like smartwatch. They can use to also to processing. Input the output and store um, by themselves. So let's move to mid range computer. It's a medium sized computer. It's sometimes like for computer system and also the server. They encompass a broad range that capacity between high end PC server and the mainframe. A server that can control access to the hardware, the software, and other resources on the network the uh, the they can retrieving the data from a database or supplying access to application software then there this is an example of the mid-range computer type the first is mini computer as you can see they they call it as mini but actually their component is a very big like a box and also it's mid-range, you can see there, there are three, three mid-range there, a tall box. Okay, they are used for server and more powerful than a personal computer. Okay, the third one is a mainframe computer. It is uh, more larger and more powerful than a mid-frame computer. Because they have a uh, great processing speed and more data storage. They usually store the larger scale of storage for the organization and for the scientific research. And also consumer statistics and census data. As you can see there, the example, as you can see the picture, there are a tall box. They are that actually the mainframe computer because they um can they can store more data 
for each one of them. And they, as you can see in the room, it's more likely a research, a research, a scientific research room that have, uh, that using the mainframe computer. So next is supercomputer. They are the fastest and the most powerful computer from all other computer because they have a high capacity of storage that been using for the large organization. They are typically used to process a massive, massive amount of data. They sometimes used to uh, analyze a mathematical model and a complex physical phenomena or design, such as a climate change and for the climate and the weather and also the evolution of the cosmos the this computer is using for to check the climate in the whole in the whole world it is used and using a strong computer to get a strong satellite so use by using this computer they can get the picture of the climate and also the picture for the for our cosmos and the universe picture we move to system units the system unit is a house of the computer that store the device component this component is a very important for the computer to process analyze and storage uh, as you, as we all know the power of personal computer is based on their speed capacity and their flexibility as you can see there the important component is a microprocessor motherboard and the memory all right now these are the important component the first one is the motherboard they are the component and the device that connect to the system board this is uh to to uh to hold the data path and the traffic monitor they um, for the characteristic of the motherboard if you can see there they have a slot they provide a slot and they use uh, to connecting connecting line this is a pathway for the communication among the electronic component they are the board that hold the component of the electronic and next one is microprocessor or uh, also we call them as a cpu center processing unit this is a brain of the computer and there are um as you can see the characteristic they have a uh, microprocessor chips uh, in the size of bit such as 16 32 and 64 and other is multi-core chip is this the two or separate and the independent cpu with a system unit uh, such as example for the quad core they support the four core processor it's become more powerful, it's become more uh, flexible, they can do more job. And uh, if you can see, they are processing of a specialty processor. It is a coprocessor that improving a specific computer operation, such as the graphic processing unit, GPU because uh, in taking the 3d image and also for gaming features so they also uh, this uh, microprocessor for for a powerful computer and next is the memory and you can see this is for contain on chip that connect to the system board system board so it is used for holding area for data. They also used to do the instruction 
and the F information. As you can see, they are the they are the two of important memory. This is a RAM. As you can see, the RAM they are the cache and the visual memory. They are used for temporary and they have a high speed holding area that divide the program between the memory, CPU and the storage. They are and the storage they are they call in in bytes such as megabyte and gigabyte. And also they have room. Room is read only memory. This is an information that store by the computer. They are non -vol volatile. It mean is who the uh, data and they cannot be changed. The CPU can read and retrieve the data and program uh, and the program in the in the room, but they cannot change it. Uh, there are the special ins instruction there, such as the start button, the keyboard input, and the access memory. And the next is the flash memory. They are the combine of these two uh, RAM and room, and also the startup information. They actually use the BIOS, and also act as second storage device connect connect the connection. As you can see the picture there, this is at the slot for the memory of a computer. Okay, now let's see the system unit in in the device. Uh, as we see earlier, the desktop they have two system unit, which is tower unit. If you can see, like a tower, is tall and big. Or they also use all in one. In nowadays, we have a PC that can use a touch screen. And second, in the laptop. Uh, for the laptop, they have a ultrabook uh, that use uh, let, uh, let such as the laptop and the tablet. They use the built-in system unit. And next is tablet. We have we have also we also have mini tablet. They also use a built-in system unit where the microprocessor and all the memory and their motherboard are all in then all in there in the device. It's also such uh, to the smartphone. As you can see, they also a built-in device and a wearable. Also, they have an embedded computer in there but um, because their size is small the component is more smaller and the storage is more smaller than the computer all right in in the system unit they actually can expand more to this component the first component is slot and card they actually expand the system capabilities, such as the graphic card, expand the computer graphic, and the network interface card. They can connect device to a network, uh, like cables, and also wireless card for the network of wireless, like Wi-Fi, and for a secure, secure digital SD card. They are more portable, use, usually used for mobile phone. And the next expansion is a buses. This is to connect the part of the computer to each other and the various other components in the system board. They usually the USB, we all know. This is universal serial bus that connect external to the USB bus. The firewire, as you can see, and the PSPCI Express, they are used a single dedication pass for each connected device. Right. These are the other components in the system unit. The first one is port. This is for socketing, connecting the external device to the system unit, such as USB, HDMI, 
Thunderbird Ethernet, if you can see the below. There are various types of port. And they also use a cable used to connect external device to the system unit. And they are also the attached to the device and the other end is a connector that attached to the matching connector port. And lastly is a power supply. Some computer they, they use a direct current for power and they are converting for alternative current. Yeah, it's like uh, they used to charge and also use for uh, cont uh, contain the battery. As you can see, the direct current, like a desktop computer that directly using electricity. And for the AC, alternating current, they use a battery. We use it to charge also, and they can hold the battery and the power. And that is such as laptop, smartphone, and tablet. And lastly, it's a wireless charger. In now, in now technology, they also have wireless charger, wireless power, uh, wireless power bank charge. Uh, usually, uh, more used to smartphone. Now we move to input and output. Input is a uh, is something that we uh, use. We give the instruction for the computer. So the computer process it, and the output is is the sh uh, the computer show us on what we want to see. In some device, they combine both input and output, such as phone, drone, and headset. Let's we take an example for the phone. The phone, the input we use is to make a call. When we push the button call and the process the system unit, they process and connect to the network uh, to reach on who are we calling. So the output is we reach the call and we can make a call. Now is input. The input is uh, any data or instruction that used by a computer. The input they are used to translate data into a form that system unit can process. Uh, as, uh, now, uh, if we can see, there are more examples. These are the example of the input device. Uh, the, this the keyboard we use and the touchscreen nowadays also an input device and so on and now the output device output is a process data or information that give to us the user the data such as text graphic photo video and audio is given to the user these are the the photo of example of output uh, the monitor, they give the graphic photo for us to see. Same goes to the projector. They project the picture for us. The printer, this uh, they print out. They give the output for us. Uh, and the output audio such as headphone and earphone. Now, we move to the storage. The storage that is uh, holding data or the, uh, the instruction or they also hold the information for the future use. The storage medium is the physical material on, on which a computer that keeps the data or they keeps the instruction and the information. And the storage device is the hardware that record or retrieve the item from the storage media. As you can see there, the storage medium, when they want to reach their memory, they use the reading process. And from the memory, 
when they want to save it to the storage, they use the writing process. All right, now, before we go to secondary storage, they actually, they have a first storage. The first storage is actually a RAM, which is a RAM. They can retrieve the data, but they cannot install or they cannot store the data. And now, the one that can store the data is the secondary storage. In this secondary storage, they actually provide a permanent and non-volatile storage. As you can see, the the example is an uh, such as the disk, hard drive, hard drive, and the SD card, and also the flash drive. And, and you see the picture below. It is an uh, example how the volatility of the storage. When you turn on your PC, when you do your working, the first one to retrieve the data for your working is the first storage, that is RAM. And for the second storage, is a content of the hard, hard drive. They are non-volatile. Non so when the PC is off, everything is shut down, the screen is shut down, the first storage is a RAM, also shut down, they don't hold of the data. And, but the data is, to, is stored in the secondary storage. And the characteristic of the secondary storage is four of the, of the, four of them, this is first is media. This is something that pull the data and the capacity. This is how the big is the capacity of the storage. One tera, one terabyte or five hundred gigabyte. And the storage device is a hardware that read the data. Is where the internal hard drive or external hard drive, or even the SD card. And the access of the speed, this is sometimes, they use um, 2.0 or 3.0, is the speed that how fast the drive can retrieve the data in the particular storage device. Now we move to the example of the storage, if you can see there. These are the example of the storage and secondary storage device. This is hard disk, USB flash drive, memory card, RFID tag, optical disk, and also the cloud storage. And now, for the first example of the storage is the hard disk. This hard disk that contain one or more inflexible circular pattern that use a magnetic particle to store data. This is something when you when you see the hard disk in the computer, when they retrieve the data, they have a magnetic coil in there that used to store the data. So they are actually the moving magnetic particle in the hard disk. So they have a internal or external hard disk. Well, their capacity is uh, larger, sometimes reach 500 gips of 1 tera, 1 tera gips and 2 tera gips. And next, we move to solid state storage. When you say solid state, it is a non-moving part. Why? Um, they actually can be portable. The non-moving parts mean is that data then then don't have a magnetic coil and then the moving in the in their in their device, so they don't vibrate or anything. And uh, you can see they have a solid state drive drive and this this is more faster and more durable than a hard disk. 
They also have flash memory card. They use for laptop, smartphone, and also for GPS navigation system. In the car, they use. They also use uh, the GPS navigation system in the SD card. And for the USB drive, or they also call flash drive. They can connect to US to the USB port, and their capacity from one gig to two hundred and fifty gigs. This is more smaller than the hard disk, and they are portable. We move to the storage. This is cloud storage. The cloud storage is an internet service that provides the storage to the computer or mobile device of the user. The, they are actually supplied by the server that provide cloud storage or also called as an online storage. They are easy to upload and share file with everyone through any device because the storage is only need a internet connection. And the fourth one is optical disk. And they actually an optical disk they use uh, flat. Uh, they are also portable, and they can, they actually contain uh seven hundred megabyte for CD and for DVD. They can uh, store the story up to four point seven uh, gigabyte, and for the Blu-ray optical disc, they can store up to fifty gigabyte. The disc they also uh, can divide into a disc room, which the user only can read but not write on it, or cannot uh, also cannot erase the data on it for the uh, disc of art such as DVD art, CD art, or Blu-ray art, which is the user can. Write once, only write for once, and it cannot be erased. But uh, for the disk of RW, is mean for rewrite, where user can write and erase for uh, for this disk because they are rewritable format, such as CD CD RW DVD RW. All right. These are the other example of the storage. As you can see the picture, NAS vs SAN storage that that is network attached storage and the storage area network is from the enterprise storage. And there are also the magnetic stripe card, smart card, RFID tag, and microfilm. In this card, they actually hold our data about our bank account. And our our information in ID card, and also the film microfilm contain the picture, the store the picture for from the camera. Let's move on to the next subtopic, which is the system software. System software works with end users, application software, and computer hardware to handle the majority of technical details. System software consists of four types of programs, which are the operating system, utilities, device drivers, and language translators. The first type of programs in the system software is the app Operating system. An operating system is a collection of programs that handle technical tasks. Now, let us learn about the three functions of operating system. The first function is to manage computer resources such as memory, processing, storage, input or output devices, monitor system performance, schedule tasks, administer security, and start up the computer. The second function of an operating system is to provide user interface. 
Operating system allows users to interact with application programs and computer hardware through a user interface. There are two types of user interface, which are the graphical user interface and command line interface. With a graphical user interface, you interact with menus and visual images. With a command line interface, the user uses the keyboard to enter data and instructions. The third function of an operating system is to run application. Operating system loads and runs applications such as word processor and spreadsheet. Most operating systems support multitasking, which is the ability to switch between different applications or memory. For example, with multitasking, you could have Word and Excel running at the same time and switch easily between the two applications. The program that you are currently working on is described as running in the foreground. Meanwhile, the other program are running in the background. Now, let us take a look at the features in, oper in operating system. The first feature is booting. It is starting or restarting the computer. There are two ways to boot a computer, which is like a warm boot. It, is, it occurs when the computer is already on and you restart it without turning off the power. The second one is cold boot, which is starting a computer that has been turned off. Um, the second feature is the list of features that, that are in common with application software. We have here, the first one is icons. Icons are graphic representations for a program, type of file, or function. The second one we have here is pointer. It is controlled by a mouse, trackball, or touchscreen. The third one we have is windows. Window is a rectangular area for displaying information and running programs. The fourth one is menus. It provides a list of options or commands that can be selected. And the fifth one we have here is tabs. Tabs divide menus into major activity areas such as format and page layout. The sixth one is dialog boxes, which typically provide information or request input. The sixth one is gesture control. It is the ability to control operation with finger movement, such as swiping, sliding, and pinching. The last one is help. It provides online assistance for operating system functions and procedures. The third features of an operating system are files and folders. Files are used to store data and programs, meanwhile folders store related files. In this slide, we will focus on the following three types of operating system, namely standalone, network, and embedded operating system. The standalone operating system functions entirely independently from a network on a computer or a mobile device. This ensures that the tasks of an operating system can be performed on the device. Network or server operating systems are operating systems designed to help computers work together and on a network rather than use in a standalone mode. For example, a large company may have a server running in the Windows Server operating system in the organization. A computer can connect to the same network to gain access to its information, resources, etc. Examples include Windows Server, Red Hat Enterprise, Ubuntu Server, and Unix. The embedded operating system is designed for a specific purpose. For example, smart TVs that connect to the internet, a video camera that can stream live footage, and the GPS system that is installed in most mobile devices. The next type of programs in the operating system is utility. A utility program is system software that helps users to analyze, configure, monitor, or help maintain the computers. Most operating systems include a set of basic utilities for users and additional utilities that could be downloaded if needed. Examples of utilities include backup software that helps a user create backup copies of the files on their computer, a device manager that helps a user install new hardware such as a mouse, USB, and so on, disk cleaners that helps a user to free up space on a storage device, file managers that allow users to manage the files that are stored on their computers, system or task managers, monitors that summarize a computer's performance for the user. Without these utilities, it would be a lot harder for users to manage and keep their computers running optimally. A device driver is also one of the type of program in system software. 
It is a software that contains a set of instructions that command a computer's operating system on how to communicate with the hardware so that it can function properly. Device drivers allow communication between the operating system and all the devices, such as the mouse, keyboard, print, printer, and so on. The fourth type of system software is the language translator. A translator is a programming language processor that converts a computer program from one language to another. It takes a program written in source code and converts it into machine code. It discovers and identifies the error during translation. It translates high-level language program into a machine language program that the central processing unit, CPU, can understand. It also detects errors in the program. There are three different types of translator as follows. First, compiler. A compiler is a translator used to convert high-level programming language to low-level programming language. It converts the whole program in one session and reports errors detected after the conversion. Compiler takes time to do its work as it translates high-level code to lower-level level code all at once and then saves it to memory. A compiler is processor-dependent and platform-dependent, but it has been addressed by a special compiler, a cross-compiler, and a source-to-source -source compiler. Before choosing a compiler, user has to identify first the instruction set architecture, the operating system, and the programming language that will be used to ensure that it will be compatible. Secondly, interpreter. Just like a compiler, Interpreter is a translator used to convert high-level programming language to low-level programming language. It converts the program one at a time and reports errors detected at once while doing the conversion. With this, it is easier to detect errors than in a compiler. An interpreter is faster than a compiler as it immediately executes the code upon reading the code. It is often used as a debugging tool for software development as it can execute a single line of code at a time. An interpreter is also more portable than a compiler as it is not processor dependent. You can work between hardware architectures. Lastly, assembler. An assembler is a translator used to translate assembly language to machine language. It is like a compiler for the assembly language but interactive like an interpreter. Assembly language is difficult to understand as it is a low-level programming language. An, assemble, an assembler translates a low-level language, an assembly language, to an even lower-level language, which is the machine code. The machine code can be directly understood by the CPU. Moving on to the next subtopic, which is the application software. What is an application software? Application software is capable of dealing with user inputs and helps the user to complete the task. It is also called end user programs or only an app. It resides above system software. First user deal with system software, after that he or she deals with application software. The end user uses application software for a specific purpose. It programs for simple as well as complex, complex tasks. It either be installed or accessed online. It can be single program or a group of small programs that are referred to as an application suite. Some examples of application software are word processing software, spreadsheet software, presentation, and graphic. This slide shows you the types of application software, which are the first one is presentation software, the second one is multimedia software, the third one is spreadsheet software, the fourth one is word processing software, and the last one is database software.